21 follow up the Institute of uh, Mathematical Statistics, uh, which is an award for groundbreaking work on um, random dynamical systems and stochastic PD. And today's talk is on a um, topic related to both of these. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me well? Okay. So, so this talk is about ergodic theory of stochastic various equation. And it is at the intersection of probability theory, dynamical systems, and, and PDEs. I don't assume everybody knows um, all about these, these, these subjects. So there will be some gentle introduction. But you know, I think you, if there's something that's totally unclear, you should, you should stop me. And I was, I was warned that this is a, like a friendly event or something. So I, you know, I, I actually enc enc encourage you to, uh, to do that. The main, the main theme for this talk is uh, stationary regimes for um, complex, complex, di complex dynamics. Uh, stationary regimes in uh, dynamical systems and probability, probability theory are associated with invariant distributions for, uh, for, for these processes that, that we study. And the, the basic goal is to try to understand uh, long-term statistics of, of trajectories. So this is a super general uh, slide with no concretics at all. So here I'm just saying that I would like to observe a system uh, evolving in some space. So this is some, some evolving point in, uh, in, in, space, in space X. And I, want, I would like to, make, uh, to take measurements of the system, and I would I would like to justify this averaging procedure. So this is what we do normally. Is so the system is complex, as you know, some like velocities of molecules in uh, in of, of the air in the in the room, and so you can take only some measurement of this complex complex system, and then what you do is you 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 observe the system at various times, but you only do that throughout this 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 measurement, and the measurement is given by some. Uh, measure some observable, which mathematically speaking, just some function uh, from the configuration uh, space into, into real numbers. And then you can ask yourself, does, does this averaging procedure make sense at all? If, if you keep collecting data, will this converge to, will this, will this average, averages converge to anything? Uh, will they, will the limit, if it exists, will it, what, what will it depend uh, upon? And uh, how, how does the initial condition, how does the starting point, how does that influence the, uh, the behavior of this, of this, of this averages? And in the dynamical systems, in probability theory, this, the limiting behavior of this, it is described through uh, the Birgoff ergodic theorem, which, which basically says that if you have uh, if you have a measure preserving dynamic, dynamical system, then yes, this uh, endergodic one, then these averages do converge to well-defined numbers, and the limit doesn't depend on the initial condition at all. And so that's the loss of memory, the loss of memory phenomenon. So in that best best uh, situation, there is uh, there is a uniquely defined limit for this. Um, you know, it's one lim uh, a certain number depending on this on this function f. What can happen is that there may be several different regimes, and in each of them, for each of them, uh, this limit may, may make sense. But then, if you don't know a priori in which one you are, then a priori you don't know what uh, what this what this limit could be. And so, this entire branch of uh, knowledge it's, uh, that studies invariant distributions uh, and the ergodic invariant distributions, ergodic means indecomposable uh, ones. It, it gives the answer to, this, to, 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 to these questions in terms of in terms of stationary uh, st uh, station regimes and variant and variant variants. Now, you know, usually, um, um, so initial conditions are distributed. Certain distribution, you can ask yourself, does the distribution of the system at time one, at time two, at any positive time isn't the same as as, 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 a, as a time zero so that's the definition of invariant distribution and usually you would think about uh, about studying the systems uh, studying invariant distributions as, uh, sort of having time running forward you start observing the system and you want to start at certain distribution and see what happens uh, what happens at, at, at later times and you hope that at least the distribution is gonna is going to be the same 
Uh, it turns out that often it makes sense actually to consider a different procedure. And that's what I'm going to explain in this, uh, in this slide. So suppose you have a very simple, uh, so this is not about the Berger's equation or a stochastic PD yet. So this is a super simple uh, random dynamical system. This, this, uh, it, it's, a random, it's a random dynamical system on, on real numbers. Uh, so at each time, at each time n, you have a map uh, from real numbers into real numbers. And this map is random. And what, what, this, uh, what this map does is that you, you take the current position of your particle, you multiply that by number a, which is small, uh, which, is, which, is about, which is less than one. So, so this is a contraction. And then you add a, ran a random perturbation. And this happens at each, at each time n. And so at each time n, you have this, this map where you contract things to the origin and then shift by random by random amount. And then you do this at the next time step again. So you contract and then you shift, shift, shift randomly. So there are these two mechanisms here. One is you can call this dissipative mechanism where you contract things to, towards the compact part. And there's noise that, sh that, sh that shifts you around. And so the question is, does this work out a, uh, a, stas a stationary regime? And this is actually an archety archetypal situation where, where it does, the system does uh, work out a stationary regime because you have this, these two competing mechanisms. One is the dissipation and another is noise that kicks you out of the equilibrium. That's sort of a typical situation where things get stable. One reasonable way to, uh, to look at this is, you know, you really can write out these, these compositions of this map. So you start at time M, and you want to understand what happens to a system between times m and uh, time m and n in the future. So all these are random, random transformations. All the all these transformations are independent of each other. Um, and so this is the this is the composition of all these maps. So you start at point x at time m, and then you th this produces the answer at time at time a, uh, at time n. Now, because the system is so simple, we can just plug in these formulas into, into each other. And of course, this is, this is the result. Uh, so this is the starting point. It got multiplied by A this many times, but then the next, uh, the random variable got multiplied by A uh, also many times, but not as many as here. And so each of, each of, those, each of those random variables comes as, a, as an additive perturbation uh, with some power of A in front of that. And so suppose I'm interested in studying the system over long, over long, over long times. And uh, long time means that uh, the distance between N and M grows. Uh, I, I want to understand what happens over an interval of length N minus M, which, which, grows, which grows to infinity. And your natural instinct tells you that you should take this point, uh, this time n to, pl to plus infinity. You want to study what happens to the system in, in, in the future. But it turns out that there is this, uh, and this example illustrates this perfectly, that there is this nice, uh, nice procedure that is called the pullback procedure. So that's where you take the starting time m to minus, minus infinity. And so if you want, if you're interested in understanding the behavior of the system on over long time interval, sort of at infinity. And this limit means that you pretend that infinite, infinite time is now, and you are, but, but, the, hist but the history is, in, is infinite. And so you want to understand what happens, what happens in present, given, the, given all this noise, uh, given the realization of the noise in the, in the past. So what does the dynamics work out at present uh, given given all the uh, given all the noisy past, this is called the pull the pullback procedure. And for this problem, the answer is, is sort of trivial. It sort of stares with you, right? Because with each, as uh, as you as you let m go into minus infinity, you just keep adding more and more terms to this series. I mean, this is a finite sum, but as as m goes to infinity, you see like every finite piece of this, it's, it, it's stabilized, it doesn't, doesn't change. So what happens is only that you add more and more terms and they, they decay exponentially. And so there is, there is a converge, there, this, this converges. And so the limit as m goes to minus infinity is, is well-defined. So you may, you may now, I mean, this is a, this is a formality. You say that uh, your random dynamics initiated at point x started at minus infinity 
and the, you won't compute the outcome at time n. It's just given by this infinite infinite series where uh, you have uh, all these random variables associated with the past, uh, each multiplied by um, by coefficient a, a squared, a cubed, and so on and so on. And these are decay exponentially geometrically decaying decaying numbers. And so the sum of the series always makes always makes sense. Always actually almost almost surely the series is 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 convergent. So almost surely there is uh, there is an outcome. Uh, and that outcome you can I, I already introduced two notations for that. So one is this, another is let us just for for brevity call it uh, x at time and associated with the randomness amelia and you can you can explain various properties of this of this process x uh, i mean remember this is this is the process right so this this is enumerate this is indexed by these times n so this is actually random a stochastic, stochastic process indexed by by all those times you can describe all of this using the the, the term uh, one force one solution principle um, so what happens here is that, uh, first of all, this process except it is a it is a global solution. All of these random variables associated with times n and and n minus one here. So they satisfy this. They are mapped into each other by this by this random random transformation, right? So this is the random transformation. Um, this is what it is in this example. You multiply by a and add this random random perturbation. So all these random variables are worked out by the dynamics they are really they're related to each other by by these transformations so you can say that this is a global solution global uh, global solution in time and this formula it gives you xn as some functional of the of the noise in the past uh, it is a stationary process which means that things are uh, invariant under under shift so this this potential this um pardon me, this, this 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 functional of the past I mean, if you shift uh, all these uh, all these all these random variables by by time one, uh, then you will just obtain a shifted shifted version of of, of your process at a, at a different time. So this is a stationary process, and you can you can show that this is a unique global solution uh, that is a stationary process. Now, of course, you can start at any point uh, and just apply these transformations backwards, right? So, I mean, this is an an invertible invertible transformation, right? You can just subtract c and multiply and, and divide by a to recover uh, things backward but that will not give you a stationary process because typically if you if you keep unwrapping this into in the reverse time you will get an exponentially growing process um, but this one is a special one that is that is stationary and so you have this special uh, i mean this is a caricature picture but you know so you have this global random trajectory x capital x and everything else gets attracted to this tra to this trajectory. So what happened here was that I started the this random dynamics at the same point, uh, small x, and first at some time, then at some earlier time, and then I took the the starting time to minus infinity, and this all these trajectories they become closer and closer to this um, global solution that is the, <laughs> this this red curve. In particular, you can also compute the distribution of this process xn and because it's just the sum of infinitely many gaussian random variables with the right weights you can compute that this distribution is also gaussian and this distribution and the importance of that is not gaussianity but it's the fact that it's a unique invariant invariant measure and it is unique because if you start with something else this pullback procedure will bring you back to to this to the special uh to the special solution and so this is a very uh, that was a very general picture but uh the way i mean you can interpret you know once once again so the, the the importance of this picture is that it turns out that at any time at any time n there is a unique value that is worked out by the dynamics in the past there is a unique value that's compatible with the history of the forcing i call these random uh no noisy perturbations so that, that's 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 forcing that's what kicks the system out of equilibrium and one, one force, one solution means that there is this, this unique global solution so that, that's obtained by this uh, procedure, by this pullback procedure that takes into account, that collects information from the past. In this system that I just considered, there is a lot of contraction, right? I mean, I, on purpose, I made it so that you multiply by this number A that is, that is less than one. So um, 
So there's a lot of contraction in the system. And in general, uh, if you're interested in stationary distributions of Markov processes given by random dynamical systems, you don't have to have this one force one solution principle, but you have this very general, uh, this is a very general idea that goes back to Lejeune and uh, Yves Lejeune and uh, uh, a couple of papers by Le Drapier and Young, by Sam Young, uh, where they, uh, they sort of do this systematically and they what they do is they, if you have a stationary distribution, it is it can always be decomposed as some mixture, as some mixture of these, what is called sample measures. So this is uh, you sort of condition on condition on the past, and this this measure it is called the sample measure mu uh, associated with the randomness omega. Uh, so that what uh, that is the random distribution uh, worked out by the dynamics in the past. And in general, this is a no, this may be a non-trivial distribution, but in the one force one solution situation, these are delta measures. So these these histories of Almost every history of the forcing gives you exactly exactly one point. So one force one solution principle is where you have a delta, a delta measure uh, that gives you just one one point associated with each past. But in general, you know, if your forcing is not random, even in deterministic such situations, you can have I don't know strange attractors or something. So it, the the distribution may be uh, may be highly non-trivial. But one force one solution is so that's that's the uh, this is the sort of the prerequisite. So we see that if you, that there is this natural pullback procedure that sometimes uh, helps you to construct these global solutions and gives you uh, gives you an expression or some representation for invariant invariant distribution of your system. And for that, you need to start the dynamics in more and more distant past and see what comes out in the present. Now to the Burgers equation. So the Burgers equation is one of the simplest uh, evolutionary uh, nonlinear models, and uh, it is um, it has several interpretations. And one one is that it comes from from the fluid uh, fluid dynamics. Uh, it sort of looks very similar to the Navier-Stokes equation and Euler equation, except this is a one-dimensional model, and so it. Um, Burgers himself introduced this as a uh, simplified model of turbulence. So the real turbulence is Navier Stokes and Euler and some, something like this. You know, there, there, there is a whole bunch of um, systems that are like small variations of, of those. Um, so Burgers introduced this as a, as an, in an attempt to study a one dimensional uh, turbulence picture. So the resulting picture turns out to be not, well, there, are, there is some resemblance. But this is really super far from the from the real turbulence, it's exactly for the reasons that, that, that there is too much contraction in this system. You don't see a lot of chaos that is characteristic for earlier. Um, but this is also related to all kinds of interesting things, saying that the equations, not everything is going to be seriously articulated. Um, so what this equation does is the following. You, there are several interpretations. So here I'm sticking with the fluid, dyna fluid dynamics. It's a one-dimensional um, PDE. So time is time t is one-dimensional. The coordinate x is also one-dimensional. So this is this, the spatial thing. Um, U denotes the velocities of particles. So u at point u at point tx is the velocity of the particle that at time t located at, at, at position x. And then if you look what the left hand side is, so this is uh, anyone who studied this hydrodynamic equation, then like this is the first calculation that you do. The left hand side actually computes the acceleration of the particle at uh, at time t uh, at, at, at point x. It's simply it's simply like this. If you if x is the trajectory of that particle. And u is the velocity. So the velocity is the first derivative. Then you take the second derivative of this, you apply the chain rule, and this is what you obtain as a result. So this is the acceleration of the particle. And what the right hand side says, I mean, it should tell you something about the force, the forces that are exerted on the on the, on the particle. And so there's some external for, uh, forcing f. And in addition, there is this friction, uh, friction forcing uh, given by the Laplacian. 
of the second derivative with the coefficient nu in front. So nu, nu is called the viscosity. Actually, when the viscosity nu is equal to zero, and also let's say f is also equal to zero, then this equation just says that the particles do not change their velocities at all. The acceleration is zero. And then it's, this becomes a, an archetypal uh, situation where um, shock waves emerge. Um, so if you have, so imagine that this is, this is the graph of all these, uh, at the, of the initial, initial value for this, for this problem. So at, at point X, the velocity is, is U of X. So these velocities are high, these velocities are low. And then uh, these particles move to the right with high velocity and these move to the right with, with, with low velocity. And so eventually, eventually these particles will take over, will take over the particles in front of them. Um, and so in principle, you could have a multi-valued solution. Uh, but if you, if you insist that uh, there should be univalued solution, if you insist on uh, certain conservation laws, then you will end up uh, with a with a solution that is that has a, a downward jump like, like this. And there is a natural way to to pick one out of uh, one physical solution out out of many. And so for zero viscosity, you always have solutions that have these shocks. Uh, for positive viscosity, you always have a smooth velocity field. So you sort of still have something like this, but uh, these things get 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 uh, get smoother because the potential because the pardon me because the viscous term with the Laplacian it always it, it acts like like the heat the heat equation so it smooths smooths these things out. Um, okay, so this is what the equation does. So let me try to recover this picture where we have contraction and noisy perturbations. I mean that linear equation that's that's what it was doing. You had uh, the dissipative thing, remember, it was present due to the multiplication by this small number a, and then we added noise. A somewhat similar thing happens, happens here. So due to the presence of this term uh, of the friction, so the energy dis dis dissipates. And so some, some energy gets, gets lost to, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the heat. And on top of that, we might introduce this this external forcing, and so in, in the end, if we hope, why 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 can we hope uh, for some balance uh, for some existence of a stationary regime, maybe global solutions? Because there we, we we should hope for this balance between the end uh, the forcing that pumps energy into the system and dissipation uh, dissipation that is intrinsic intrinsic into uh, in the in, in the in the equation. So in this talk, uh, I'm gonna take. I'm, I'm going to take F to be a random, to be a random force. Uh, it's going to average to zero. I will not give you all the details about the force. So it's many, many things are going to be sort of impression, impressionistic. Uh, and but I'm interested in environment distributions and global stationary solutions. And I want to, to if not explain, maybe just uh, talk about one force, one solution principle for this equation. And it turns out that to write down the solutions of the, uh, the solutions can be written down in terms of uh, either Lagrangian minimizers for zero viscosity or, or for direct, through directed polymers uh, for the positive viscosity case. And so that's what I'm gonna uh, talk about. Before I, uh, our question, where we are talking if, right, so if the, if the viscosity is zero, we're going to be talking not only about weak solutions. There are, there's no uniqueness for the weak solutions, but we're going to uh, we're going to be talking about so-called entropy or viscosity solutions. So these are special physical solutions. Uh, they, they they are weak solutions under some additional uh, requirement that I'm. I don't want to to talk about that much. Um, so the there was some work uh, on compact or periodic case. My own work belongs, or the sort of the most interesting things that I would like to talk to to talk about, that that belongs to the uh, these are studies of the non-compact case. So let's see how how far I can go. So how do you solve the Burgess equation? Uh, despite the fact that it looks like a hydrodynamic equation, it actually can be can be solved uh, by a reduction to the to the heat equation. And this is how it's done. So you can introduce. You can, you can instead of considering u, you can cons you can consider 
the potential capital, capital U uh, function whose derivative is U. And the same you apply to, to, force, to the forcing. And in terms of U, in terms of capital U, you can rewrite this equation using, uh, it, it's going to look like this. This is a hamilton Jacobi equation with quadratic Hamiltonian. And actually, this equation is, uh, it has gained some, some fame because this is uh, the famous uh, KPZ, Kardar Parisi Zhang equation. Martin Heyer's Fields Medal uh, was about, he was, he, he was able to uh, rigorously construct solutions to this equation when, when F is a, a space time white noise. In my talk, it's not, not, it's not gonna be space time white noise. So what I'm gonna talk about is not the KPZ equation, it's just some close relative in the same universality class. Um, so how do you solve the uh, how do you solve th this equation? You you make another substitution like this. It's called the Hopf Hopf substitution, although it was discovered earlier. Um, and if you once you make this substitution, then this function v uh, it solves this heat. This is this is a linear heat heat equation uh, with multiplicative coefficient in front of in front of v here. And these, an equation like this can, can be solved with feynman katz formula. And this is the feynman katz formula. Uh, what does this formula tell you? It's is this. It says that to find the solution of this equation at time t at point x, you must uh, start here. And from this point, emit a Brownian motion that goes backward in time. And so it goes, it starts at time t, and then it goes backward in time. So hence minus s here. And this is a Brownian motion with some, some coefficient in front. And what it does, I mean, you, you integrate with respect to the winner measure with respect to the distribution of this Brownian motion. And, and then it does two things. So one is uh, it collects, uh, so there's this integral, it collects the potential uh, from all these places we, that, that it visits. So this is the cumulative potential accumulated by this, Brown, by this Brownian motion in backward time. And that gives you this exponential factor. And also there is this contribution from the initial condition. So it's at time zero, we, are we were given, if we were solving the Cauchy problem, we were given some initial condition. And so this is time zero, and this is sort of the landing point of this, of this Brownian motion. And so as a result, you have these two contributions, one from the, from the initial condition and the other, another one uh, from, the, um, potential, uh, from, uh, from the potential that the, Winner process the, the Brownian motion collects information uh, from. And so let me state this more precise, not really more precise, but let me stress this that uh, this, this is an artificial thing. Like I'm introducing this, this, this winner process, it's not related to the randomness in the, in the forcing. And so if F was random, then now we're dealing with two random, two, uh, two layers of randomness. There's this random environment, and in this random environment, on top of that, you're you're studying this 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 this, Brown, this Brownian motion. Okay, so this is how you solve the viscous uh, Burgess equation. But then you can you can take new to new to zero and ask yourself what is what is the limit of this, because we're interested in, in solutions of the inviscid equation as well. And it, it turns out that there is a probabilistic uh, derivation from um, of that, and there is there is there are PDE versions and. But essentially, you're going, to, you're going to see some contribution. Uh, I mean, when nu goes to zero, it will sort of stress the most important parts of um, the, the, the contributions from, from like best places of, of this potential. But on, then also there is another, another fact that you have a Brownian motion. Uh, so where, where is that concentrated? Um, anyway, when nu goes to zero, you have, uh, you have this variational principle that I, I call uh, Hamilton, Jacobi, Bellman, Hopf, Lux, Alinic uh, variational principle. And um, so it turns out that if you're interested in the inviscid Burgess equation, what you're supposed to do is this. Instead of the Brownian motion, you just you must consider arbitrary, uh, absolutely continuous curves, gamma. And for each curve, you must compute this action. Uh, and this action has three parts. So there is, and they are all, in some way, they are all present in the previous form. They, they result in various parts of the previous, um, they, they result from various parts of the previous formula. 
this comes from, this is the initial condition so this is the initial potential u uh, this is the you can say this is the kinetic energy associated to this to this path and this is the the potential accumulated by this by this path along 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 its way and once you have computed this action for all possible paths you have to minimize uh, to minimize this action over over all these paths that terminate at time t at point x and then once you once you're done there are two ways that you can use uh, to compute the small u i mean remember this this is the this is the capital u but small u you can either um, sort of by definition you take the derivative of capital u with respect to x because that's how i introduced capital u uh, but also it turns out that uh, instead of that you can just take the derivative of this of this path the slope of this path at, 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 the, at the terminal point and that that gives you the same the same number so typically there is only there's only one minimizer for this for this pro for this problem and that minimizer can be associated with the path of the particle uh, so a priori we don't know which particle arrives here we have some initial distribution of velocities and then there is noise uh, I mean there is this uh, potential that accelerates uh, all those particles so which one arrives here turns out for that you have to solve this problem find this optimal path and that will give you the trajectory of the, of the particle and its slope here will be the solution of the of the Burgess equation at this point and then you should do this for all for all points each will come with uh, with its own minimizer and you just read off the solution of the Burgess equation from the slopes of those paths there will be always points where there are two minimizers I and mean, typically you have for almost all points there is just one but there will be a point inevitably and many of them uh, a discrete set where you will have two minimizers and that corresponds to shocks so for most points you have just one particle bringing some velocity with it but but here there is this particle bringing some velocity from the left and this one brings some velocity from the right so they, they disagree and so in general the solution will look like this it will be it will, it will have a smooth part but then there will be a downward jump and this way two different minimizers might last a lot to different uh, initial things, to different velocity. velocity. Now, now, if, if I want to find this one, you know, any dynamic property that you can use this equation, I need to understand what my divisors do over long time interval. My divisors were used for Clement plus quarter. The first, the first paper that, that did this in a meaningful way was this paper by four, these four authors, and they studied this dynamics on the circle instead of the entire line just just the circle so this is the compact case they assumed that the forcing was of this form so you had several white noises um, so the forcing was rough in time but it was smooth in space so these functions f they were they, 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 they were smooth and uh, what they proved among multiple other things was that the ergodic components were given by by this set so first thing is that it turns out that for the dynamic, uh, for the dynamics, the Burgess dynamics, if you fix the average, the average u, so this is the average of, 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 of the circle. So if you fix that, uh, then this quantity is, is conserved, uh, is, it is preserved by, by, by the dynamics. So if you start with some value v, then it's, it's always preserved. So then it automatically means that you don't have ergodicity because this is something that you remember about very distant past. past. If you start with this value of, of v, you will always retain the same thing um, and so it means that the space of solutions is fully aided into into these uh, into these spaces and what they did is they, they said that the dynamics on each of them is ergodic and on each of them there is one force one solution one, one force one solution principle a unique invariant distribution that is obtained by this pullback procedure and this is what my next slide is about um, so things are on the circle and so this is the space and this is this is time and i'm interested in how things uh, evolve in, in in time and i'm interested in recovering this pullback picture and one force one solution so what does it mean i'm fixing some uh some time some time t i'm interested in recovering some solution um, at time t and then i i assign some initial conditions and time minus t minus capital t and then I solve this variation of principle. So I find all these minimizers um, for each point here. I find all these minimizers. So I get some foliation 
of this part of the cylinder into those minimizers. And then I take this minus t to minus infinity. And for each value of minus, minus t, I, reconstru I construct its own, its own foliation into, into all these minimizers. And so what they proved is that this picture stabilize as, t, as this time minus t goes to, goes to minus infinity. There is a limiting uh, foliation into these you know, one-sided infinite paths. And these infinite paths can be understood as as uh, as one one sided one sided minimizers, and then you can you can read off the their slopes uh, from so all these minimizers uh, stabilized limiting ones, right? And so you just take the limiting slope or the slope of the limiting minimizer, and that's going to give you some velocity field, velocity profile at time at time t, and you can do this for all times. All these pictures are going to be consistent with each other, and this limiting procedure will give you will give you a global solution. So at each time t, you will you will have some velocity field, and they all will be consistent with each other. So the limiting foliation into minimizers will automatically give you uh, a global solution of the of the Burgess equation. Now there is there is an interesting point here that I told you that these are one one sided infinite minimizers. But if they're infinite, uh, they cannot minimize anything because the the action associated to an in, infinite minimizer is is, is infinite. You, you must take the infinite path, and typically, if you uh, you know if you want to if you want to work with this, first of all, what what, what does what does the initial condition mean? And then you're integrating over more or longer and longer intervals. So of course, it doesn't make sense to say that. The, the limiting curve is a literal minimizer because because all actions are infinite, and so the the meaning of this minimization claim is that all local perturb finite perturbations of these minimizers they give you worse action. So you cannot um, you can I mean the the entire minimizer of course has has infinite action, but if you if you change this this infinite trajectory over a finite time interval you're going to to have to have a uh, to have a larger larger action, and also you can make sense of the uh, of the differences in action between between two infinite paths. So you take two infinite paths, each of them has infinite action, uh, but the difference in action between them still makes sense because you uh, because they spend a lot of time a lot of time together they, they 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 get closer to each other, which is another property that is called hyperbolicity. Now the reason why why this works. The reason why this works. So why why do the limit why how do I construct these this limiting this limiting minimizers? Um, it's because these paths uh, that, that are that are minimizer minimizers of, of action. I mean their velocity is actually the velocity of of, of the particle trajectories, and uh, you can prove a bound on how fast that particle could be. And it turns out that on any, on any finite, finite interval, uh, that a, minim, a minimizing path connecting, connecting anything here to anything here cannot be faster than anything. I mean, if it's super fast, imagine that it's super fast, then it would make, make a lot of rotations and it's more economic to go, to go straight. That's basically it. And so it means that high velocities are forbidden. And then if you have a bound on the velocity, then it means that you have uh, you can use Arcelas quality theorem and because because that gives you compactness and so you can at least you have a chance to choose a subsequential subsequential limit and then it turns out that the limit is is actually unique I mean this is a like long story short of course um, now there were various results in other compact settings multi-dimensional and boundary conditions and I'm just mentioning this but the most interesting uh, things, they, they actually happen in the non-compact setting. Um, so people tried first to, to try something that is sort of quasi-compact where you have, so you're on the real line and you apply some forcing in the middle. Uh, so you stir particles in the middle and you want to understand, but you don't, you don't force particles sort of at the periphery and you still want to see if, if, if there is any stationary regime emergent. And that's, that's, that's indeed what, what, what happens. 
uh, but the truly non-compact uh, picture it's uh, for the for the inviscid equation is these these two papers um, so first we considered uh, space-time homogeneous Poissonian forcing based on point uh, it's it's a, it's it's a forcing that's concentrated on the cloud of randomly distributed uh, Poissonian points in space-time and then I wrote this paper where uh, we were treating where I was treating the um, case of kick, for, uh, kick forcing so what is kick forcing it means that we apply so now we're on the entire real line uh, kick means that we apply forcing every now and then actually at every integer time so at every integer time we apply uh, sort of an instantaneous kick to the entire velocity field and it's random uh, and then we let the between between those times we let the burgers equation evolve without uh, well being being unforced so you, you kick and then it's the system solves the unforced Burgess equation another kick changing velocities of all particles simultaneously and then it evolves again for a while and so on and so on all these kicks are, are random and independent and this is sort of an approximation to white noise I mean in the white noise situation you um, you kick more and more often like infinite infinitely often there's still an action uh, but, uh, action as associated to paths. Now it looks like this. It's now it's time time discrete sort of. Uh, you still have all these all these terms, uh, but the instead of the derivative, you have you have these uh, you have these sums of quadratic quadratic terms. And uh, because because things are now in the non-compact case, uh, it's uh, it was it was considered a hard problem. But we were able to solve it using uh, some techniques that go back to uh, to these to these people, especially to Chuck Newman. The result that we, that uh, that I can uh, I could prove for my, for this kick model and for the other Poissonian forcing model is 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 the same for every average velocity. If you fix average velocity, then there is exactly one. Uh, global solution with that velocity, and it's determined by the history of the forcing. And it's obtained by exactly the same the same procedure. You just start assigning initial conditions and more and more distant past, and you just see what comes out at the at the present. So the difficulty is, of course, that now these paths there's no bound on the velocity. And why do these paths stabilize, or why their behavior is somewhat compact or something? That was a that that was the unresolved big big issue back then. So we needed to construct what we call the 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 Boseman functions. So these are, if you have two infinite minimizers, uh, two infinite minimizers, uh, then in the compact setting, so remember they were exponentially converging to, to, to each other. So that was called the hyperbolicity. And so the difference between two, act two infinite action made, made sense. Turns out that something like this also can be done, done here. We actually, we believe that these minimizers uh, can actually converge to, to each other exponentially fast and at a certain rate, but that's only conjecture at this point. Um, so there are these things that are related to the KPZ universality, and that's that's how this this conjecture is supposed to match that. But what I actually can prove is a much weaker statement. So these two different minimizers, I only can say that, uh, like I only can claim a limit version of that. So that it means that they approach each other at, at times, maybe. And instead of exponential rate, I, I only have this uh, function that decays in time as like just the inverse of, of, of time. So this is a much weaker uh, claim than th that that the one that we we should we think should hold true. But we, but this already allows us to introduce these these differences of actions between two, two infinite paths, and that's that turns out to be a key key thing in this. In this process, okay. I don't know if you can really see this, but this is a picture that corresponds to the other situation where we had Poissonian points all around the place instead of kick time, kick forcing. What happens here is that uh, you you sort of you sample uh, points at random at random positions, and your action instead of the action that that I have been writing before. 
you're considering this. So this, uh, this term is still the same, but the forcing uh, is, is minus delta function at each, at each of those Poissonian points. And so what you're gonna do is for each point here, you want to find a path that hopefully goes through many of those Poissonian points and minimizes, minimizes all this. Uh, to minimize this, it must pick a lot of these Poissonian points, but it cannot pick everyone because it's penalized by, by, this, by, by this velocity. So as a result, it picks some of those. And of course, if you consider each, ne each next point, it sort of, it gets attached to, to the already existing picture. As a result, you get, you get all these trees of minimizers. And essentially the color scheme is that uh, all these points whose, uh, all these points uh, that are, that have sort of common ancestor, they have the same, the same color, they, they are of the same color. So it means that these, uh, all these, all these paths, they, they coalesce before, before time zero. Now in this model, actually, if you consider the infinite time horizon, then all these minimizers coalesce. And so there would, there would be just, just one color. So that corresponds to this, to this picture with the, with the continuous space where we only expect these minimizers to, to come closer together. Uh, but in, the, in this, this model with this discrete area, points, they actually, actually, they always have that. Okay, so okay. that, that, um, um, I'm still, I'm still confused about, about my planning, right, right. How, 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 how much, much did I Okay, so, so all, so all that was the, the, that was all the implicit case. Uh, now, for, let me, let me skip uh, some important, some technical slides. This is just to say that there is some actual work there. Um, but for, for positive velocity, uh, there exists all this work in the compact case. There were some attempts to do, to deal with the non-compact case, but uh, the first the first paper we are uh, we actually deal with the like truly non compact case where potential where, where where the forcing is is a stationary process in 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 space in space time doesn't decay anywhere so that's that's my work with my uh, former student Ling Lee and this is what we're doing so consider the kick forcing situation you you can solve this by uh, by hope cold hope cold transformation you can convert this uh, to the heat equation, and you can solve that heat equation with kick forcing, again, with feynman katz formula. It's gonna look like this. Uh, this is just sort of the, the, the time discrete version. You still have, um, because, the, because the heat force, uh, the, the, the heat equation, uh, you can solve that with uh, convolution with Gaussian or Poisson kernel, depending on uh, whether you're a PDE person or a probabilist. Um, so this is what this is what you're gonna see. So to to solve this uh, that heat equation, you will have to convolve the initial condition with this kernel that is uh, that looks like a sort of a conflation of the Gaussian random walk. So all these are Gaussian kernels and exponential weights picked up by by the uh, picked up by these by the random walk from the from the potential. And so this is a, as a result, this is a convolution of, of many of these, many of these kernels. So at each step from time zero to time one, you convolve the initial condition with some random kernel and then with another one and, and, and so on and so on. And so this looks like the product of positive matrices and there should be, well, the hope was that there should be something like the peron fabinius theorem. Uh, peron fabinius theorem says that if you take one matrix, with positive entries, and if you keep multiplying it by by by, by itself, it will sort of st stress a certain single di single direction. It will work out some um, well the the eigen direction corresponding to the largest eigen value and unique eigen eigen vector. And so the hope here is is similar that if you keep applying these operators, there will be some functional yeah. functional direction, infinite dimensions that's going to be stressed, and uh, your global solution will be that random. A random function that will vary from time to time, uh, and it will be obtained by this one by this pullback uh, procedure. And if you look at 
this 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 this, uh, this convolution this version of Feynman class formula. So there are all these Gaussian things in there, and you can interpret you can interpret this averaging this averaging here as, and you start with a Gaussian random walk, but then on top of that, you're introducing some new exponential weights. And so in a sense, what, what you're doing here is you're integrating not with now, not with respect to the Gaussian random walk, but with respect to a Gibbs measure associated with this free measure given by the Gaussian random walk and the energy coming from the coming from the, this potential. And you can introduce this, this this distribution on these on all these paths. So initially you had just Gaussian random walk, but now you um, to each traject to, to each path of the uh, of the random walk you assign uh, you assign a certain additional energy accumulated from from the environment, and then you normalize by this partition function, and that is just the integral of all this because you want this to be a probability measure. And now you have a distribution of, on, on all these paths. And this distribution is called the polymer method, the polymer measure. So it is, uh, this thing is called the, um, this is the directed polymer. And it, it sort of tells you what, uh, what this polymer chain, the it gives you the distribution of the polymer chain uh, given by, sort of determined by the interaction of the chain of the monomers with, its, uh, with, with their neighbors. And with the environment given by, by the self. And the big question is then what happens to this polymer distribution as, as n goes to infinity if you take this point to infinity of, to, uh, along a certain direction? And this is what we, what we prove. Uh, this, is this, this is this theorem with my student Ling Li. It says that um, with probability one, there is always a, uh, there is a limiting distribution. If you take this point to infinity in a certain direction, this is a flipped picture because I'm actually interested in collect, collecting information from the past. And so all my polymers, they sort of grow down into minus infinity. And we can prove that this, this procedure, when I take this endpoint to infinity in a certain direction, this procedure gives you a limit, uh, a limiting, a limiting what is called infinite, infinite volume polymer, polymer measure. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's an infinite volume Gibbs measure satisfying the the and Lenford real conditions. What's important is that um, using that polymer measure, you can now you can now use that measure to read off, so to to, to, to obtain the, the global solution of the Burger's equation at, at time at time n at point x. So this is the infinite volume polymer measure associated with this um, point n uh, time n and point x. And it turns out that the limiting uh, to, uh, to construct the solution of the of, of the Burgess equation at this point, you have to take this infinite volume polymer measure, take its distribution at time and marginal distribution at time n minus one, and integrate x minus y with respect with respect to this distribution. Anyway, what's what's what should be important here is that in um, in the zero in the zero viscosity case, right? We had this. Uh, we had this, we had this limiting, limiting paths. These are zero, zero viscosity here corresponds to zero temperature in the statistical mechanics language. In the positive viscosity, instead of a single path, you have a whole distribution. So that's that's the polymer. And it turns out these polymers also have limiting, uh, limiting distributions, and you can use them to construct the, uh, the global. The global solutions. Now I can, I can feel by. To me, it looks like maybe this is already enough information that maybe I should just just stop, stop here. Now there are <clears throat> there's a bunch of uh, more recent results, um, and maybe maybe I should just mention open problems, and that that, that that will be it. So all this somehow works because one one big reason is that. Uh, in the action, there was this quadratic term. It's super important for us that this term is, is really quadratic. I mean, this comes up in uh, various other places. Um, one particular reason why, why this is important for us is because the, the Burgess equation due to that quadratic term is shear invariant. If you shear the entire space time, the resulting things that you, like all these objects after shear, 
So they still give you um, the solution of the Burgess equation. The minimizers will be the minimizers. The polymer measures will still be polymer measures in the sheared um, environment. And that turns out to be a super important symmetry that we're that we're using. If we get rid of that, if we consider an equation that that's more general, it has this quadratic thing. I don't know, plus something else. Uh, there's no there's no result at all. And this is a big um, like the biggest open open problem is what what happens if you get rid of sh of shear invariance. Um, there are lots of things here, but you know, say higher dimensions. In higher dimensions, we can prove existence of all these limiting objects. One sided minimizers gives, gives measures. It's, um, but uh, for unique, there's no, there's nothing for uniqueness. And this, and the reason is that the two dimensional geometry is much more complicated than the one dimensional geometry. In one dimensional geometry, these minimizers they cannot cross each other, for, and so they're all ordered, and that's super nice. In two dimensions, they can they can do these things, and we don't know how to. How to exclude these 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 situations? And as trivial as it, as it sounds, that's a serious uh, serious obstacle. And in all these in all these problems, not just in in this, but in all these last passage percolation problems, first passage percolation problems, people just don't know what happens in, in like optimal paths in high dimensions. What do they do? It's it's a bunch of it's a bunch of open questions. Um, I think I should just just stop here and thank you for all the attention. So, you know, you, you you listened very well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Any questions from the audience? I can't remember that well, but um, years ago there was this thing constructed for Brownian Castle, and I remember by Martin Howard to go up there and there was these images that looked very much like this picture you had in the Fasani case with the kind of trees and the different trees kind of. Um, it was a, it's an arrow of time, and somehow they're all like densely and intertwined with one another. And yeah, so it's a cosmetic thing that I've noticed, but I was wondering if you know. Right, but there, there, there is a. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what exactly you're referring to, but you know, all these models that, um. So, so there is a there's a whole class of models, uh, usually they're related to growth models or, or interacting particles maybe you encode interactions between particles and the configurations in some profile that uh, that grows grows with time uh, sort of at random at random locations in some non-linear non ways and so all these uh, essentially all these models they should belong to the same to the same universality class called the kpz universality class and I mean, one one way to to obtain a to obtain some growth model from this is is the following: ask yourself uh, what it, construct level sets of action from this from this picture. So instead of saying uh, for this point, find the optimal path. That's that's one thing. But you also you know what the optimal action is actually is, and so you can fix that value and find all these points that have the same. Uh, the same the same action and then you will get pictures uh, all these level curves they probably will resemble more uh, the picture that you, that that you have in mind and uh, again so there's a variety of models uh, we were able to do more for this one uh, than everybody else because uh, because of the sheer invariance um can you say something so in all the examples that you mentioned the forcing term was like um Sort of maximally independent in some sense. It was like given by a product, and you assumed that it was IID. Can anything be said for if there's um you know something softer like um... this? Is actually I think I think it's listed as one of the open problems. Really, oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, there's no. It's a, it's a, it's a good. Maybe I just deleted that. <laughs> I mean. I mean, once you once you introduce once you introduce dependence dependence. I mean, what what's important in my model is from layer to layer you have complete independence. So that like right, in, in time, time in time yes. in time it's white. And it, now in space it doesn't doesn't have to be. You can have long term um, long long range dependencies in space. But in time that is that is important to me. Again, maybe it's a little cryptic because I didn't really give you deep reasons why the shear invariance is important for the lack of time but 
if they are independent from each other, different layers, and if you apply the shear, uh, as a result, the environment is it has the same distribution as it as it did before the transformation, mm -hmm. and for that you need independent like total independence from layer to layer, to, from layer to layer. If you have a little bit of dependence in the time direction, which is you know it's going to look like. So this is a caricature of dependence, right? So these things depend on each other. And then you, but then after you apply the shear, which is, you know, it's gonna look like this, this transformation. So this dependence is gonna look like this. I mean, this is a caricature, but it's clear that the resulting uh, random random uh, resulting potential will not have the same distribution as for the transformation. And that, that for us, for us it feels, um, you know, you know, certain things will go through the entire problem won't. Is that the challenge in the contact case as well? This, in, in the compact case, it shouldn't be that important. Uh, I don't think, I don't think anyone has written down this case with uh, positive, um, po positive dependence range in the, in the in the t direction, but that that actually doesn't doesn't seem to be. To be really important to me, uh, perhaps there is some there is something there that I'm that I'm not seeing immediately. But it, that sounds, you see, the compact case is, is actually super super tame. You know, after all we, we've done we've done here. Uh, I mean, in principle, these these paths in the non-compact situation, right? I mean, they uh, say you're interested in the in the optimal path between this level and this level. Well. Okay, and so maybe you get something like this, but then you you extend this level further down, and even if you're interested in in the optimal path between these two points, who knows? Maybe this new uh, strip of of randomness, maybe it has maybe it opens some super good like new new good locations, and maybe the maybe the optimal path will go there. Well, it will cost you some kinetic action, but why doesn't this why doesn't this happen? And you know, as you go further, maybe you will go, maybe you will start traveling further and further away, and and maybe this 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 has no convergence. And so we prove that this doesn't happen. That actually there is certain straightness of paths that actually guarantees that there, it's it's our replacement for for the for the compactness argument in the in the well in the compact case. Mm -hmm. But um. Uh, when we go back to compact case, like you know, that that was the biggest the biggest danger really, that things can go uh, sort of blow up as you uh, as you increase the time time horizon. In the compact case, I because the, these things do not happen. I think it's it's only a technical matter. To thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. I have a very stupid question. So, what what is you consider the Durkheim situation to the discrete case? Pardon me. Discrete case. Discrete case. Yeah. Uh, can we can we do it in general? Why not, right? Well, so so there are there are various. I mean, there are various models where where this is this is what is called the. See, let me talk about last passage per, per percolation. So that is a class of models where. You at each node of this lattice, you have a random variable. Say this is coordinate one one, so you have c one one here. This is i j. This is this is c i i j. So they're random, and then you consider, you take this point and maybe this point, and you consider the, the optimal path. Optimal path meaning that you are trying to minimize the sum of these. Minimize or maximize you 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 choose, but there's you want you want to find the optimal. V or A and an optimal path through this random random landscape, and uh, and then you want to, you want to study the what what happens with uh, with the with this path as uh, as the distance between these two points goes goes to infinity, and so there is uh, there's a huge huge literature on this, um, but uh, but for these models. It depends on the distribution of these of these of these Xs, whether you get these results or not, and so it turns out that uh, it so this depends on a certain thing that is called the shape function. It sort of I flashed that at you, but I didn't talk about that. But essentially, the conclusion is that 
I mean, the, the best you can do today is that this picture with infinite geodesics in this random uh, landscape, it is, it is established only for the case where these random variables are exponentially distributed, <clears throat> all, all with, the same, with the same distribution, in, in, independent, right? So these are IID, IID exponential with the same parameter, uh, parameter lambda. So, so then all this picture with uh, coales coalescent minimizers uh, covering the entire plane uh, with the same slope, with the same asymptotic slope. Uh, so it holds true. If you go, if you if you don't insist on this exp, uh, this distribution being exponential, then uh, then you have results that are conditional on some hypotheses that are not verified. But for the Burgers equation, uh, it turns out that we can we can we can do the entire program. We can go through the entire program, and that program. There was an attempt to mimic this program. By, I mean, there are some papers that I actually mentioned in my uh, in my slides, um, but you don't quite get there. There will be some some exceptional directions or something. It's uh, it's not it's not known. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again.